I, I want you to look at somebody and I want you to say, what is your hope? We're going to start off with uh, some scripture. That's a pretty good base when you're going to teach. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 through 13. For now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, and a better word is perfectly, just as God knows me perfectly. How many people know we don't know our own heart? We kind of think we're better than we are. But God knows the truth about us. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says that our, our, our heart is worse than the devil. The devil lies, but our heart can lie to us. Greater, and it says in the original Greek, it's so sick, it can't be cured with medicine. It can only be crucified. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. I'm going to read Save time, because I'm going to be teaching tonight, but uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. There are three great Christian graces, faith, hope, and love. And for the most part, we all know a lot about faith. We're church people. We've been saved for most of our lives, most of us. A lot about love, but we're really kind of vague about hope. Hope is included with those others, but if you ask the average churchgoer, for example, what hope is, not so much. We read about hope all over the Bible. For example, in Louisiana, uh, I've already, you, you already hear the sports people, uh, they hope the saints won't embarrass us again. We hope our candidate gets elected. We hope we don't drown since it's been raining here every day, flood warnings. We hope that the lines in our face won't get any clearer. We, 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 we hope we don't get audited. We, you know, we hope we don't get COVID. We hope our neighbors would get, move out. We hope a lot of things would happen. You know, we secretly hope somebody is going to get hurt. You know what I mean? We hope we're going we're gonna to win the lottery or whatever it is. We just had someone related to our family uh, won $250,000 in the lottery yesterday. The sad thing about it is they don't go to church here. See? <laughs> they probably not tithers anyway, so, you know, whatever. My point is, we tend to generalize hope on circumstances and emotions. We, don't, we hope we don't get a disease. We hope we, don't, we, we hope we get a raise. We hope all kinds of things. We hope we're going to go, like in my case, I hope I shoot a trophy buck this year because I know Danny will, you know. <laughs> And Danny's the kind of guy, if he fell off a roof, oil would come up out of it. You know, he got some, I, I don't even know anything, it's some magic or something. Everything they touch, it, it works, you know. I got I to gotta work extra hard, you know. Then I have to hope I don't resent them because I'm envious and jealous. You understand that? And then they're good looking. Oh, my God. Terrible. They're not bald. They're not old like me. Okay. So my point is, we kind of defile hope based on personally what we hope will happen for our benefit and what we hope won't happen. Do, do I get an amen on that? But now we're not talking about our hope. We're talking about biblical hope. Like I hope I am first going up in the rapture. I, 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 I hope I don't have to wait for the second coming. I hope I don't have to go through the tribulation. I hope when I'm 95, I'll still be alive, living large and still in charge. You understand that? But we want to look at what the Bible says, okay? It says there are three great Christian graces, faith, 
hope, and love. Now, the average church goer uh, might say, well, my hope is salvation. I want to go to heaven. I hope I'd be saved so I could make it to heaven. Or when I die, I hope I have eternal life. My hope is in eternal life. Another might say, my hope is in death, that when I die, I'm going to go instantly to be in the presence of Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm tired of this world and all of the suffering and all the perversion. I just want to die and be released from pain and suffering. I, I didn't think I'd ever be old enough to find out that people pay a doctor to give them medication so they can die. I read about a couple that had been married, uh, uh, Lester and Elaine and I, but they, they both uh, decided they wanted to die together, and they, their family came over and sat in the room, and they held hands, and they, uh, the doctor gave them the medication, and everybody witnessed them dying together holding hands. I mean, my God, you know. Uh, you know, when you when, when you know going to extreme to die, you're gonna die. But you, you know, you don't want to pay a doctor, and you don't want to invite your family over to watch you die. I, I mean, people. Are, well, I'm gonna talk about that tonight. Let's move on here. Uh, so, another might uh, seemingly the hope is all about being carried away from the troubles in this life. You know, people. I've heard people say before, because I've counseled a lot of people after these 45 years, and they go, you know, I just wish I could die. Or I wish I had never been born. Understand that? There's something about us where our emotions speak louder and do more damage to us than our logic, our reason. Understand that? Depression and anxiety and worry, all those things are emotionally driven by whatever we have in our imagination. And there's no spirit in that. So some people who do not have God and don't have a spirit and don't know the word of God and don't have fellowship like we have with, with the Holy Spirit, uh, they are living completely in a natural world circumstantially and reacting to it emotionally. And, and most of their life is juggling to avoid things. Amen. So they can't ever be successful because they are simply avoiding as much as they can. So seemingly, uh, the, the hope is about being carried away from troubles of life into the arms of Jesus. Now, when I say I want to go into rapture, I'm not trying to avoid anything. I just read that there was going to be a rapture. I want to take advantage of that, okay? And so that's going to be the stinger in this message because the stinger is always in the tail, okay? So, and you might ask somebody else about hope, and I got, God's word does not present eternal life as hope. God's word is always the ultimate authority. You understand that? We're not talking about philosophy. We're not talking about somebody's uh, ideas. The word of God is our authority. You don't, uh, you, you, you don't challenge God's word. It's always the authority. So God's word does not present eternal life as our hope. So our hope is not an eternal life, even though Christians say that all the time. I, it does not say that Eternal life is our hope. So it's not salvation, and it's not eternal life. And it's not death. It's appointed under man wants to die and after that the judgment. But it can't be death because the Bible says that we won't all die. So our hope can't be death because we won't be going through the portal of death. So the Bible does not present heaven as our hope even. So it's not salvation, it's not eternal life, and it's not heaven, and it's not death. Salvation to begin with is already our present possession. In other words, we're not looking for eternal life, we have eternal life. We're not looking for salvation, 
we have salvation. But it's not heaven either. So you're not waiting for salvation. It's yours now. Would you look at somebody? I, 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 now I'm saved. Okay. See, that's present tense. It, it, in John 5, 24, Jesus says, truly, 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 I say to you, whoever, how many whoever's we have here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're watching by television, wave your hand out and say, I'm a whoever too. Yeah, don't leave yourself out. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes on him who sent me, that's Father God, has eternal life and will not be judged, but has already passed from a death sentence to eternal life. So that's our history. That's behind us. That's not in front of us. That's behind us. So our hope can't be heaven. Our hope can't be salvation. Our hope can't be death. Our hope can't be eternal life. And so he says, truly I say whoever hears already, already has passed a death sentence and has eternal life. So we can't hope in something we already have. In 1 John 3, 2, the Bible says, beloved, that's us, now, when? Now. What time is it going to be in 10 minutes? Now. So we're always living in present tense. It's always now. Now we are children of God. We're not going to be. We were adopted already. We were born again already. We are children of God already. So that's now. We are living in now. And remember, you always want to live in now because that's a good foundation for the next now. It's like breathing. Taking a breath right now is not nearly important as the next breath, because if you don't care ever to take the next breath, you're dead. So you're always living in life by always living in God's eternal time, which is not past nor present. It's now. Faith is now. So salvation and eternal life are already ours now. Salvation is not something way off in the gates of heaven. Salvation is something from way back at the cross. Now, guess what? That's where it was materialized was at the cross, the completion of the cross. But the cross was not where it began. It began in the heart of God. Before there was a world, he, he, he loved you and already shed blood of the lamb before he built the earth. You are not an afterthought. Your salvation is not an afterthought. And your salvation was not some good religious thing you did, but I, I accepted Jesus Christ. No, he chose you. You didn't accept him. There are 8 billion people that are most will never see eternal life. Never. There are people in church right now around the world that will not see heaven. We already have the word saying, many will say to me in that day, I cast out devils. That's not the Baptist. Right? Yeah, I spoke in tongues. That's not that. that it, it, uh, he's talking about people that are in church, believing they're full of the Holy Ghost. And he'll say, in that day, many will say, I served you. I did this. I did that. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Amen. And depart into other chaos and darkness. So heaven is not going to be crowded. Now, why do I say that? Because who in the heck are you that out of 8 billion people, you're in church today worshiping a God you cannot see? That's not because you're good. That's not because you're smart. Before there was a world, he already chose you. And because we're not good, no, not one is good, not one is righteous, somehow in the mind of God, he chose you to live with him 
and in him for all eternity and gave you the grace to believe a fairy tale like somebody was going to die on a cross and all your sins past, present, and future are washed away. And now you went from being whoever you are to a child of the king, joint heirs with Jesus Christ to the inheritance of the father. And you think you're smart? You should really pity some of your cousins and your relatives. Don't be angry with them because they don't appreciate your witness. They don't respond to your witness. They don't have the grace you have. They don't have the mercy you have. You should pity them because they'll never see eternal life. That's just a fact. It's a scary thing to think even the worst of people will never see heaven. And we will. You say, well, it's not fair. No, it's not fair. It's called just. It's just the way it is. Remember, the Bible is the ultimate authority. Don't add anything to it. Don't have an opinion about it. Believe it just as it is. Don't manufacture it. It's not philosophy. It's not theology. How rude to think you could study God, theology, the study of God. Who in the hell do you think you are that you're going to put God under a microscope and figure him out when he's unsearchable and the natural mind cannot understand the things of the spirit? How rude, how proud, how carnal that is. Salvation is something from way back at the cross that already was determined the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world that we stand on today. Eternal life is not in the future. Eternal life is not your hope. Eternal life is in your past, way before there was an earth. That's not something you can comprehend. That's something you decide to believe. That you are on a rock that cannot move. The kingdom cannot be shaken. But then what about those who say, our hope is in death and the release from this world from all the suffering and all the perversion and all the evil. And 1 Corinthians 15, 5 promises us that not everybody is going to die. So death can't be about he heaven. It can't be, I hope can't be about death because the rapture says that in a moment, in an instant, in a billionth of a day, we are going to be changed into a glorified body? No, that's not something, again, you want to you figure out. Don't waste that. Just be glad. <laughs> Just rejoice in that. That, that, that. Look, you know, hey, hey, that's way above the Saints winning the soap, Super Bowl, right? I, I mean, uh, my goodness. All right, so 1 Peter 1.3 says something. Now, bless be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again in, unto a living hope. So now we know our hope is not salvation. We have salvation. Our hope is not eternal life. We have eternal life. Our hope is not in death because we may not die. But we find out that our hope is living. It's not, it's not a mounted one on a wall. It's not something that, a trophy from a lot. I, I hope is living right now. So now this states that we have a living hope. Our hope is alive. Would you look at somebody and say, my hope is alive. So now look at, we're going to look at verse 4. It moves on in First Peter. And it says, uh, to an abundance an inheritance of incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away. So our faith is alive. Our hope is alive. It's 
incorruptible, it's undefiled, it's holy, and it never can fade away. You talk about a strong foundation, and where is it? It's reserved for you in heaven. Now remember, our hope is not heaven. Our hope is in heaven. Look at somebody, because I want you to remember this today. Say, my hope is not heaven, but my hope is in heaven, and it's living, and it's reserved for me. Yeah. Ain't that right, Anthony? Now, so our hope is there, and it's alive. And it's not eternal life. It's not heaven, but it's in heaven, and it's alive. And it cannot be shaken. It cannot be defiled. It's rock hard, steady, done already. So what then is our hope? Well, let's see. It's important for us to know what our hope is. It would be ashamed if many Christians don't know their hope. And remember, my job is to deal with a lot of ministers and a lot of people around the world. I'm going to tell you what, a lot of people don't know what their hope is. They go to church, they go through the motions and so on, but they, they really have not grasped the revelation of what their hope is. Their hope is in a lot of things that I just mentioned that our hope is not. We're not talking about a hope that is circumstantial or even comprehensible. We're talking about a revelation that the Holy Spirit has enlightened you to be able to see and have give you the grace to be able to believe something that is so abstract and unearthly that few people can grasp it. In Ephesians 1, 8, Paul says, I am praying. Now, he, look, he wasn't praying for the Jews. He's praying for the church people. He said, I am praying that the eyes of your understanding, that's your spirit, not your brain, not your natural mind, not your natural understanding, that the eyes of your spirit would be able to have enough light, revelation from the Holy Spirit, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, we're talking about the saints, not church people, not religious people, not every Tom, Dick, and Harry people, not people that live with a carnal mind. We're talking about spirit-filled people who are spirit-led by believing the word of God, not just in their mind, but being living epistles where the word of God has become flesh, where they are walking, talking witnesses, totally contrary to the world. Amen. He says, I am praying that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened so that you may know. Now, how many people know you have a thinker and you have a knower? Most people spend all our time thinking, but few people spend time knowing. They have a guess, but they don't know. Now, I know in whom I have believed. Therefore, my soul is persuaded that I know what I'm talking about, though I can't prove it in any kind of a way. I know all my sins are washed away. I know my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. I know I have a hope that is alive. I know it's not internal life. I know it's not heaven, but it's in heaven. But I, we can't discuss this because it's not on that level. It can only be spiritually discerned. It can't be naturally understood. It's not up for discussion. Because I stand on the foundation of the word that is immutable. It cannot be changed. It cannot be defiled. It is what it is. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word will never pass away. Because the per the, my hope is living, 
and it's reserved for me in heaven. All right, so Paul says, you ought to know what the hope of his calling is. Whatever hope is, it makes us rejoice. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know the opposite of condemnation, of guilt, is joy. That's why the day you got saved, that you knew you were saved, you had intoxicating joy like a drunk paper. Nobody, nothing, ever, nothing made any sense to you other than the joy you had because it's the first time in your life you weren't ashamed and you weren't guilty. But then you went back to living in your mind and awareness of your natural person and you went back in and now you become religious trying to put on a fig leaf to fool everybody uh, that you're a Christian. And so you fool them by doing works so they could see how wonderful you are when the whole time you're compromised because you know you're not. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now, understand, we have peace with God now based on what happened way in our past. From our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and therefore rejoice when you finally know in the spirit it has nothing to do circumstantially, emotionally, rationally, in, in, in any other way. It's the grace of God that chose you out of 8 billion people on the face of the earth. You won the lottery. Thank you, Lord. And most of your family uh, can't stand you because you, you, you the winner. And they want to remind you of what you did when you were 12. They think you're crazy. You're giving that bald-headed Dago your money. Instead of reacting to them, you need to understand how in the world did God love you so much he gave you a supernatural power to believe something that a rational mind on the best day you ever had with the best intentions, you can't receive it, but you know it and you believe it and you would fight for it and die for it and stand for it. The grace of God, the impossible power to believe something that is not possible naturally to understand, and we take it for granted. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I, man, I can't wait to go to heaven, you know. Oh, God, God be glorified. All of this religious stuff we do, and if you're still nursing condemnation and guilt and shame, you need to wake up and smell the coffee. And that's what we're working on. Now, let me add a thought. My name is Mike. I'm from Algiers. Whatever our hope is, it is only one hope. Look at your neighbor and say, I have one hope. I don't have two hopes. I got one hope. There's only one hope. <coughs> There's one home yesterday, there's one hope today, there'll always be just one hope. Hey, but one hope, and it's not eternal life, and it's not even heaven. It's not salvation. It's alive. It's reserved in heaven. And it's only one hope, just one hope, only one. Me and my friend used to hunt in Colorado, and we'd ride and ride, ride in a pickup truck looking for... Uh, mule deer and we'd ride and ride and ride and he was looking at me he says hadn't seen anything no he said but look we're only looking for one Amen. you understand that doesn't matter you know that we haven't seen anything because we only we don't have to look for two we, we're only looking for one I'm going to tell you Pastor Rella you only got one hope in 2 Thessalonians 2.16, we read, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, not an angel, not an apostle, 
our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, who has loved us and has given us everlasting. How long is everlasting? It lasts forever. That's how long. Everlasting consolation and a good hope through grace. See, you can't have one hope that is reserved for you in heaven without grace because grace is the undeserved power to be able to do something that's not naturally possible. The fact that you are saved is unnatural. It's supernatural. And very few people will ever, ever manifest that since the beginning of Adam and Eve. Many are called. Few. 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 Now, remember God, at my series I've been teaching as it was in the day of Noah, when God finally, finally just, he said, look, I'm sorry I made man. I gave him an opportunity. He gave him 120 years to repent. A hundred years, Noah preached to them about the salvation of the ark. And when God finally destroyed everything, there were only eight it's going to be like that in the days of old. There ain't going to be a whole bunch of people get saved. You got a lot of religious people all over the world. But, the, but then they, they look, he, he says, as it in the days of Noah, which means in the Greek, the exact same thing is going to be. There ain't going to be a whole bunch of people get saved. Well, it's, it, 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 you know, people go to church, they make their sign on the cross, they do all kinds of things, they light candles, they do everything else. But, but, but they have no personal relationship with the Holy Spirit at all. Amen. Matter of fact, if you speak in tongues, they hate you and they think you have the devil. Yeah, they quote the scripture, but Jesus says you quote the scripture, you think you have eternal life in the scripture, but those, those testify of me. And you can't recognize me when you're standing in front of you. And you know the scripture, and you carry it around your neck. Amen. Brother Mike, you're not going to win people like this. I ain't trying to win them, I'm trying to warn them. Amen. Understand that? I said, you know, it's up to the Holy Ghost to win them. But I'm here to warn them. He said, well, you're scaring me. I hope so. I'm doing my best to scare the drawers off of you because I'm going to tell you why. That's just the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is when you find out who God is and what God has done for you. And God, even our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope. So now we know our hope is good. It's alive. It's reserved in heaven. And it's only one. Through grace, the incredible mercy of God to choose us, to allow us to be his children. See, grace is an incredible thing. It can't be earned. And it can't even be deserved. None of us deserve the grace of God. Yet every breath we take is by the grace of God. Everything we've ever done is by the grace of God. The air we breathe is by the grace of God. Your heart ticks by the grace of God. And your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. By the grace and mercy of God. They cannot be earned. It can only be, be appreciated by a broken and contrite spirit, knowing I'm so glad of the grace of God, but I know I can't even earn it, and I sure the heck don't deserve it. Because there is no condemnation to those who believe. Amen. We read in 1 Peter 1, 3, our hope is alive. It's a living hope. Whatever this hope is, it's a living hope reserved for us in heaven and waiting for us. That means a future hope. So I got one hope.
that's a future hope, that's a living hope, that's reserved, that's in heaven, and it's not salvation, and it's not eternal life, and it ain't something that happens after you die. Don't believe me, I'll read the Bible. Okay, now, the, the, the point being that our hope is future, is reserved for us, God has laid away for us in heaven, and we wait for it by faith. You see, we know we have it, but all we can do now is know it by faith because we can't show it to anybody. We can't even show it to ourselves because it is invisible in this world. But with the eye of the Spirit, if you allow the Holy Spirit, you can know that you have it because hope is the substance of what we have. And when you have joy and peace that passeth natural understanding and you have total faith in God, you have manifested what you can't see or perceive any other way, but it's as real now as it will be. Because faith is now. Now, let me show you what faith is. I mean, what hope is. Look at somebody say, he's about to tell us what hope is. He's been telling us what hope ain't, but now he's going to tell us what hope is. Okay. So in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, and you're going to get close to what hope is when we read this. It makes us rejoice. We learn that in Romans, right? Okay, so look, there's only one of them. There's only one hope. And it makes us rejoice, and we know it's alive, and it's reserved in heaven, but it's not visible. Remember, Romans 8, 24, 25 says, hope that is seen is not hope. So God does not let us see it, because we can only honor God through faith. So God keeps our hope invisible so that we can bless him by our faith that is given to us by his grace to believe something we cannot say or understand. <laughs> Give him a shout this house. Come on. What a great God almighty. My God, I'm saved. I'm washed in the blood. Now, you see, this, this, this little bald-headed dago from the West Bank in New Orleans, I'm here but I'm really seated in heavenly places. And I'm not crowded. I'm in Christ sitting next to the Father. And he can't tell me from Jesus because my life is hid in Jesus. I'm in pretty good shape. He says, it's given to us by grace. It's alive. It's reserved in heaven. It's not visible. Remember, Romans tells us, hope that is seen is not hope, but hope is in the future. And we wait by faith because God is honored by our faith. So he doesn't let us see it or touch it or smell it or see it, but we can perceive it, know it in our spirit while our carnal mind denies it. Because our carnal brain is going to rot no matter how much embalming fluid you put in it. It's going to rot into nothing, and, 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 and yet it can't perceive what I know in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Say, uh, put the hand up and say, I know in whom I have believed. I will not be shaken. I'm on a strong foundation that cannot move, change, be altered by anything. Now, in Hebrews, I love this, in Hebrews 6.18, that by two, immu look, I'm a Dago from the Algiers. I went all the way through school. Then I went to Lafayette, to college, four years and so on. But, you know, I never, I never, I never heard anybody say immutable. Immutable. 
I never learned that one time. That's why I, I took the, the test to get into college. They didn't have any mutable on that. It's a good thing they didn't because I wouldn't have known what it was. We didn't have that in Algiers. People never said immutable. Now, I can understand undefiled, but I never heard immutable. Immutable is can't possibly be changed or altered. Raise your hands. Say, thank God my hope cannot be changed, cannot be moved. It's here to stay. By two immutable things, and this was the promise of God, not St. Paul, not Luke, not an angel, the promise of God and his death, he swore by his oath, he swore by himself. How many people know when God makes an oath, that's that? There is no higher authority and never will be. So God swears an oath by himself in which it's impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hopes set before us. All that voice verse is saying is, is that by two things, God guarantees our hope that it cannot be changed or altered. Remember, the kingdom cannot be shaken. The Republicans and the Democrats and the independents, they can be all over the highway. Amen. Science is all over the highway. Right. Education, philosophy, anything you have, it's all over the highway. But not the promise of God. It cannot be shaken. Yeah. By two things, God guarantees our hope. His promise and his oath. Our hope is a guaranteed thing. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I guarantee you he's not out shopping for whiteout. He knew what he was doing before you even existed, before the, the earth you stand on was here. He already had your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and the Lamb already died before there was a world to guarantee you would be with God eternity. And all you got to do is believe it. Now, let's get to it. Now, what is, preacher, what is hope? Verse 19 says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Your soul that is all over the highway and depressed and worried and anxiety and lusting and envious and resentful and you try to hide it with a big religious fig leaf, it, 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 it's got to be anchored to something because it, it, it just goes all over. It's, 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 it's just, it, 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 you can go from glad to sad in a second. Happy to depressed in a second. Bold to scared to death in a second. Now, my son-in-law and, and, and um, my grandchildren went in the Tarpon Rodeo this week. Paul went out there, too, and Danny, and they all left me behind. But I'll get over it next Tuesday. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, they left me like a... Anyway, the wind was so bad... I forget what Noel told me, but the rope they had on the rig, the wind and the rays was so bad, it broke the rope and, and it tore it off. They went somewhere else and put the thing out and it erupted. Uh, you see, but, but God's promise is an anchor that cannot break or change. No force on earth, no force in hell can break that fact that we are anchored in hope to the Lord Jesus Christ by Father God. And the proof of it is the Holy Spirit living in you. It's an anchor. Say it's an anchor. And it's both sure and steadfast which entered that within the veil. Remember when the veil was ripped? 
the Holy of Holies. Before that, only one man could go in. But once the veil, we all had access to God if we wanted to honor him as he is. So now we find out a little more about hope. Whatever it is, it anchors us. It's inside the veil in the Holy of Holies, the heavenly place where Father God dwells. So we know our hope is where Father God dwells. In verse, let, let me help you on this. Please don't think there's a subdivision in heaven that you're going to move in. You hope it's going to be next door to Paul. Ain't no such thing. That, 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 that mansion thing has got to stop. Now, I know we're in South Louisiana. We, we got the, the oaks and all this kind of stuff. Get it out of your head. You are not living in a house. You're living in the heart of God. There's a place in you, only you. If you do not keep your reservation, somebody else is not going to be in that. No one can be in the place of Father God's heart like you. Amen. And it's reserved for you. So our hope is not salvation. Our hope is not eternal life. Our hope is not death and life after death. It's not heaven it's Jesus. Look at somebody here. Our one hope is Jesus. Come on, tell a couple of people. Our one hope is Jesus Christ. There ain't another hope. We got one hope, and that's Jesus Christ. And he's alive, and he's in heaven. Jesus is our hope. He is alive. He causes us to rejoice. He comes to us by his grace. Jesus is the only one. There'll never be another Jesus. There ain't a cousin Jesus. He is reserved in heaven for us. It is in the future that we're going to see him because if we could see him before that, it wouldn't be faith. And if it's not faith, we couldn't please God. So God keeps him invisible. If somebody tells you Jesus came and, and, and what he looked like and so on, walk away from him. He said, if somebody tells you they saw Jesus, walk away from him. You don't, don't argue with it. Don't tell them they, they need medicine. You just walk away from him. Come on. Amen. Because if you saw Jesus, then what's visible is no longer faith. And you can't please God except through faith. So you want him to remain invisible. Amen. Amen. Now, it is in the future that we're going to see him. That's the good news. He is presently invisible and exists as our one hope in heaven. Listen to me. Because faith demands to please God by believing his word where you can't prove it, see it, taste it, smell it, even understand it. Because the only way to please God is to have faith in his word. If you have faith in his word, you already have eternal life. You already have your name reserved. So in Titus 2.11, we see a step more for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should have lived soberly, righteously, and godly when in this present moment, which leads to another moment, we're always moving, living in the spirit, moving forward to that great day. The next verse says, looking for, we preached last week, he's coming for those looking for his coming. Amen. A lot of people know he's coming, but they're not looking for him. If you knew he was coming, I'm going to tell you if somebody from Topeka, Kansas, that you're related to, surprises you, calls you on the phone. We happy. We we just landed here. We come. We're taking a taxi to your house. I bet you're gonna run and wash the dishes, and you're gonna take the 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 the, the, the pizza that's been on the, the in front of the television since yesterday. I bet you're gonna straighten up. So he says you're gonna manifest your faith by living like. In the next moment, he's going to show up. 
and you don't want to miss the bus, Gus. And the next is looking for that blessed hope, even in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Clearly, Jesus Christ, again, is our one only hope. All of us have one hope, Jesus, who's in heaven, invisible on the earth. And the good news is he's coming back. We look at somebody and say, and we're going to get to see him. Now, this is when there's a prize in your Cracker Jacks box. And if you need something more specific than what we already read, 1 Timothy 1.1, Paul says, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope? That's clear. We zeroed in now that Jesus is our hope. The blessed hope of the believer is Jesus Christ himself when? At his appearing. In the second coming, everybody's going to see him. In the rapture, ain't nobody going to see him but us. In the second coming, you won't go to heaven because he's going to set up the kingdom here. And the first thing, we're going in the first load right to heaven in the rapture. But only if you're looking for him and you've been living like he could come at any moment. You don't want to be at the jazz fest with the, with the homos and the dope smokers when he comes. And ain't no second load. <laughs> yeah, let's all do it. Oh my God, don't let that happen to me. They're coming back like a thief in the night when you least expect it. So you don't want to be doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. Look, I ain't getting this out of a magazine. This is the word of God. The blessed hope of Jesus Christ at his glorious appearing. Now, look at 1 John 3. It adds a dimension that I needed to add, put a little more ketchup on it, the very depth of your being in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the children of God. That's present tense. Nothing left to do is, not maybe, is, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. We have the blessed hope, but it doesn't look, none of us look like we're ready to put on the garment, the beautiful wedding dress. It'd be, right now, it'd probably be stained and wrinkled. We didn't get her into washing it and ironing it because we didn't think he was coming right, like right now. Okay. So uh, it does not yet appear what we shall be because we don't look like anything like we're going to look like. Because, but we know, say I know. I know. Say it again. I know that I know that I know that when he shall appear, say it with me, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Oh my God. We're not just going up in the air. We're going to be like Jesus Christ. You can't understand that. I can't understand that, but I believe that. That when we go, we don't look like us going up because by the time we get to him, we be like Jesus Christ. <laughs> don't try to understand it just be glad you got the grace to believe it this is the word of God this is the ultimate authority we shall be we shall be 
But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. No longer is he invisible, now he's visible. Because when we see him, we will already be transformed into perfect spirits, able to discern God and not seeing as a cloud, as a mirror, as, a, as, as incomplete. We will know perfectly. We will have the mind of Christ. We will know as Christ, which explains why we will be joint heirs with Jesus Christ, because we will be like him. Escaping hell would be wonderful. Living in heaven would be wonderful. But being like Jesus Christ? I can't believe this other than what the word says. When we see him, we will be like him. And it says this, the dead will be ahead of us in glorified bodies. They're going to come up out of the grave in glorified bodies. That's why the last shall be first. They're going first. But we're going to them, and we're talking about in a billionth of a second, in a twinkling of an eye, you can't bleed quick enough. And we'll be transformed from these bodies that we are embarrassed about and go to the gym about and don't eat uh, twink Twinkies because of it and all this kind of stuff. And boom, we're, we're perfect like Jesus. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> It's laughable in the natural. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is and know him as he is because we will have the mind of Christ. And everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself as Jesus is pure. So you're going to have to forgive them people that you can't stand. You're going to have to stop being envious of other people, jealous, resentful, bitter, talking about them. You're going to have to stay. You're going to have to. You, you can't live like the world system. Now, the world system is getting so weird out there, so demonic. It's easy to understand you're not like them, but you're not like Jesus either. So you want to be as purified as you possibly can. So this is the second feature of our hope. Our hope, secondly, is being like Christ. Just to be saved is enough. How could you ever expect to be like Christ? That's how carnal our mind is. We just don't want to burn in hell. Just to escape hell. Escape the grave. But to be like Christ? I, I, mm. The hope of every Christian is the appearing of Jesus Christ. At that moment, we become like him. This is our hope, the sudden return of Jesus. As he personally returns, and when we see him, we will be like him. Brother Mike, you're repeating yourself. Yeah, I'm trying to make myself believe this. We will be like him, and that hope is reserved for us in heaven. Remember, again, the hope we have, don't feel too bad if you're having a hard time believing you're going to be like Jesus with a glorified body, because really the, the, the most of that is reserved in heaven, and you won't really understand that until you have the mind of Christ and you're no longer you. Amen. These things are too hard for, for uh, baby Christians to understand. They will hear a message like this and fall away because a ribeye will choke them to death. So they'd rather go to preachers who tell them how to get wealthy, how to have the best life now, how to make a lot of money, how to be, a, you know, enjoy life and so on. The Bible says, if you love this life, you ain't going with me. So they're going to tell fairy tales about Jesus on the earth that they read in the Bible, but they do not know the, 
the, they don't know the Holy Spirit personally. They, there's no works of the Holy Spirit there. There's no revelation of the Word of God there. And then one day, they go to Jesus and say, no, no, depart from me. I never knew you. He goes, you workers of disobedience, because you never knew one thing. You were never led of the Spirit, not one time. It's a terrifying thing. Say, so, well, why would God do that? Because he did it in the days of Noah. That's what I'm trying to tell you. He's going to have enough of people disobeying him and not giving him the honor and glory and not worshiping him. And, and Romans uh, uh, chapter 1, down in verses 26, 25, and 26, it says, though they knew God, they did not honor him as he says he is. Therefore, he sent darkness. They never stopped doing anything, but they, were, they thought they were in the light, but they were in the darkness. And the Bible says they thought they were in the light, but they were really sitting in darkness, but they thought they were in the light. And what happens if you sit in the darkness long enough, when they turn on the light, you're blinded. So people who live in darkness all their life and won't appreciate the light, when the light does come, they reject it because they can't see. And the appearance of Christ, at the appearance of Christ, in the very moment that he appears, we are transformed into his likeness. That is our hope to see him and to be like him. Watch, not just escape hell, not just escape this life. That's not the, our motive. Our moment is to see him as he is, and that will transfer, transform us. Be careful with escapism and avoiding. You don't want to go to heaven to escape anything. You want to go to heaven because you love Jesus. Amen. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I added these three scriptures. You'd be smart to meditate upon them. 2 Corinthians 4.18, so we fix, focus, stare, set our eyes on what is not seen. You see that this, it ain't natural, honey. You look at what you cannot see by faith, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Psalm 135, I wait for the Lord. Absolutely, that's what we have to do. We're waiting on the Lord, but we have this hope that he's coming soon. It's imminent. My hope being waits my whole being i speak every day i speak to, i i've never i don't have cancer i mean when they told me i had it i obviously didn't i'm still here but uh, i speak to myself in the name of jesus I, he is my healer by his word by his stripes by his completed work i am healed so I speak to cancer cells to die. I speak to my systems uh, to live because I speak life and death is in the power and authority I have in Jesus with the word of God. I speak to my body to line up. I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to return. Uh, you know, I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm not condemned because I'm believing the word of God. And I'm ministering to myself. I can't minister to you if I don't minister to me. The Bible says, how can you minister to somebody? You have to minister to yourself first. So on Psalm 135, I wait for the Lord. My whole very being and his word I put in my hope. And I know he loves me. I don't know how he can love me, but I believe he loves me because he's God and I'm not. He chose to love me when I was unlovable. Okay, I want you to stand, and now we're going to... At the 8, I preached, and 
the Spirit spoke to me to give this altar call that I'm going to do again. And I'm going to tell you, my natural man didn't want to do it. Number one, we didn't have a whole lot of people. And then I'm not preaching the world. And I just didn't think in my natural mind it was going to happen. So as a lot of times when I have to obey the Spirit, he tests me by no one coming. And I still had to stand, and I stood. And then finally one lady came, and then somebody over here came, and we had a pretty good show in here. And this was what my altar call was. Jesus Christ is a deliverer. There are people here who certainly listen by YouTube and live stream and television and radio that you're a Christian, you know you're a Christian, you go to church, but you allow your heart to condemn you. And your heart threatens you that somebody might find out what you did when you were 16 or 21 or whatever. And you live kind of in a not good enough kind of a spirit. You don't have the joy, the rejoicing in the promises of God. Now, God wants to deliver you. The Bible says the devil the familiar spirits of your family for generations that have, have robbed them of their, their inheritance. He is an accuser of the saved people. He doesn't accuse the world. He accuses. Right. Your own heart accuses you and condemns you. That's the Bible. The Bible says your own heart condemns you. Tell him it's a liar. I'm the one that justifies you. Now, God said in James 4, 6, that God gives you grace, which is the undeserved supernatural power to do what is not natural, but supernatural. If you humble yourself, get rid of your pride. The Holy Spirit is offering you, we're not going to lay hands on you. You're going to be delivered from that condemning spirit, that accusing devil, your lying shaming own heart about something that has kept you from being able to come right on into the presence of God, some unworthiness that you have. And I'm telling you, God will give you grace to be delivered from that. And you can be elevated to be able to be uh, waiting every moment to come into the presence of God. You'll be able to come into his presence with shouting and rejoicing and worship because you're going to understand your salvation like never before. Now, whoever needs to come, you need to come. There's no shame in coming to this. It's brilliant to come here. There is therefore now no kind of condemnation to those that are in Christ. I shut the mouth of a black mailing demon. You will never be exposed by anything that was ever in your life. It's under the blood. God himself has forgotten it and will never remember it. He cast it in the sea of forgetfulness. He moved it as far as the west is from the, the, west is from the east. There is no condemnation. You are clothed in Christ and the Holy Ghost will let no one lift up to him. You are hidden in Christ. I rebuke in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ a spirit of condemnation, a lying demon, a generational devil. Whatever your mama said, your daddy said, I break every childhood vow. I expose darkness with the light of Jesus Christ, you are loved unconditionally. You have a hope in Jesus Christ. God himself buried your old life, never to allow anyone to dig it up. You have a new life. You're a new creation that never existed before, and it's in the heart of God. You are God's child. 
Now you are his beloved children. Now, I'm going to shut up for a minute. I want you to raise your hands. I want you in your spirit or, or with your mouth or whatever you do, ask God to send deliverance from that lying devil, your lying heart, that you want to know that you know you're clothed in righteousness. Come on, saints, stretch your hands toward and pray in the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, I ask for deliverance right now. Condemnation, you got to go. Guilt, you got to go. Shame, you got to go. Strongholds that say you're never enough, you got to go. The blood of Jesus be upon every one of these people. I am a deliverer in the name of Jesus. I set the captives free from condemnation. We enter his gates with thanksgiving. Let's get some joy in this house. Come on, begin to shout. Jesus Christ always causes me to be victorious. I'm loose. Chains are broken. I'm free. I'm set at liberty. I'm alive in Christ. I have a hope. I'm going to be with Christ. And when I see him, I will be like him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you were encouraged and blessed by the word. And if you'd like to partner with us at White Dove, I want to share a couple of ways that you can give to this ministry. First, you can text the letters WDF to 45777, or you can go to our website at whitedove.org. Thanks again, and God bless.